Hello, good morning. As usual, I would like to check the microphone. Do you hear my, my voice? Hmm. Hello, hello. A uh, little bit soft, I think. Let me check by myself. Yeah, just fine. How about this? It's kind of same. Okay, let me try it again. This is different. No. Let me take a look again. I don't know. We'll see if, okay. Okay. No problem. All right. I don't know if his microphone's working or not. Well, we'll check that. Yeah. Yeah. It's always here. Okay. You got it? Is. Yeah. Okay. So I'm sort of squeezed my way in here. This here. Put this here for a second. Thank you, Hyojun. Yeah, I think now working. <laughs> I can hear. Okay. Yes. Okay. Come. How is it? How is everything? Okay, I can go here. So. How are we doing? Okay. Yeah? Okay, I have my thing not so organized today, I have to say. Well, hello everyone. Here we are once again. I have to say it. So, already the second week of January. A week has gone by, more than a week since the debacle on the 6th of January that and <clears throat> as I mentioned again is it okay with everything mm. yeah and the microphone is all right yeah okay good all right so uh, as I mentioned in my uh, little introduction that I wrote yesterday and of course I'm sure that all of you, no matter where you are in the world, are, are reading about it in in the in the press on in, in, in social media, etc., etc. You're reading about the fact that the news stemming from the riot and uh, sort of invasion of the capital, we could say, on the sixth gets worse and worse. Uh, just recently, federal prosecutors, this is from Reuters, I'm, uh, as they said, offered a new ominous assessment of last week's siege of the U.S. Capitol by the president's supporters on 
saying that a, a court filing, saying in a court filing, well, I have to get myself, a, put myself together a little bit. <laughs> the court filing that uh, rioters intended to capture and assassinate elected officials. It's really uh, crazy, I have to say. That's amazing. Now, what what should I get? I, I took copious notes this week from all sorts of things, and I didn't have uh, somehow the energy to cull what I wanted to say exactly, so be a bear with me right now. Uh, and in fact, I should keep doing this a little bit more. Well, to move to the uh, pandemic, these two weeks have been qu quite something, I have to say. This uh, United States shattered all-time records for the most COVID-19 infections, hospitalizations, and deaths reported in a day. On January 2nd, there was a record high of 302,506 new infections. This is uh, all according to the Johns Hopkins uh, site, which monitors all of this. Uh, that's an average of 3.5 people getting infected every second. On January 6th, you had a record high of 132,447 patients hospitalized. And this is, of course, a huge problem because <clears throat> hospital capacity is now overflowing and that, of course, leads to problems of care. Uh, it's very, very disturbing. Uh, now, January 12th, we come to, you had a record high 4,462 fatalities just that day. Uh, I, I just noted this little vignette to say the Boeing 747, which uh, very sadly has actually been discontinued, uh, can carry around 400 passengers, of course. That, that means that in one day, the U.S. deaths from COVID-19 we're on a par with 11 of these 747s crashing, killing everyone on board. That's kind of very macabre statistic, but unfortunately to the point. Can you people hear me? I'm, I'm, it's okay because I feel I'm not really projecting so well. Okay. <sighs> Now, despite all of this, you still find that the Republican base is so solidly behind the president. Now, uh, this is Billy Long, who's the Republican Party chairman in Bayfield County, Wisconsin. He said he was going to break away from the... Uh, <coughs> GOP uh, National Party to start a local Trump-centric third party. He said, the Trump movement is not over. We are just getting started. And he also mentioned that Trump does not have any blame, but the Democrats certainly do, along with the Republicans that follow them. And it, it's a statistic released by Quinnipiac University this week. We don't know exactly how accurate that is, but in any case, that said that 80% of the Republicans polled do not hold Trump responsible for the rioting, and 73% said that he's actually protecting democracy, which is threatened 
by the Democrats. This is really something. Uh, now, the chairman of the local Republican Party in Cleveland County, Oklahoma, openly wondered, just after the mob stormed the Capitol, he wondered, why is violence unacceptable? And he, he further tweeted, uh, what the crap do you think the American Revolution was? A game freaking patty cake? Unbelievable things. I mean, this just goes on and on and on and on. Now, two days later, the Republican chairman of Nye County in Nevada posted a conspiracy-filled letter on the committee website accusing Vice President Mike Pence, who now, of course, is the big enemy of treason, and calling the rioting a staged event meant to blame Trump supporters. This is, a, a, again, the shifting to the left and Antifa of the blame. This is a, a classic case of, of the perpetrator actually shifting, trying to shift the blame to the victim. Uh, okay, it keeps going. I can keep going on. I God, I have so much of this stuff here. Uh, Let's see, maybe just one more thing I can. Yeah, it's, it's about Michigan Republican Party chairwoman who is openly discussing civil war and martial law. This is, uh, this is not ended and this we we can hope that uh, the second impeachment, the trial of Trump, and also what I will come to in, in a minute, the the program that Joe Biden and Kamala uh, Harris is uh, actually proposing, and hopefully will actually put in effect, will actually end this a bit. I'm not sure it can. Okay, now. few more kind of tidbits. Now, this is kind of rather funny, a little bit. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Ah, yes. Here. I found this. Uh, this is the Washington Post reported that Secret Service agents who were uh, charged with guarding Jared and Ivanka Trump house in, in uh, Washington, D.C., were not allowed by the couple to use any of their bathrooms. <laughs> uh, so, they had to find ways, they, they, uh, as neighbors if they could actually use the, their bathroom and uh, made trips to the, the former President Barack Obama's house, which was located not too far from them, to also, and they rented a porta potty. Finally, they were given a permanent restroom when uh, the government decided to rent at $3,000 a month a base room studio from one of the neighbors so they could actually go to the bathroom. Uh, so far, the government has spent more than $100,000 to rent that bathroom. Okay. I guess they're uh, also worried about germs, which do not come from the family. Uh, okay, so now... What else should I talk about? Gosh, it's crazy what, uh, what's happened this week. Uh, anyway, yeah, I do move now to what is, is our outstanding possible catastrophe, which has to do with climate change, or as, as it should be called, global warming. 
uh, and it turns out that 2020 tied 2016 for the hottest year on record. This comes from the New York Times. Uh, I'm citing uh, where I get material from just because I've been asked about that on occasion. So I thought just to uh, sort of eliminate any kind of confusion uh, about whether I'm actually making up this stuff, which I'm not. Uh, I will cite the sources and people can go there to find out if they are making up the stories, which I do not think so. Now, this global warming was especially acute in the Arctic and Siberia, in the very north of the Earth. And the heat was, of course, fueled by wildfires and that pumped more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Now, temperatures in the Siberian town of Verkhoyansk reached a record of 100 degrees Fahrenheit in June. That's, in for the, those of you who are in Celsius, that's more than 30 degrees Celsius above average. That's unbelievable. Uh, now, Europe, also 2020, had its warmest year ever. And, of course, that had tremendous heat waves even into September. Uh, the United States is actually experiencing drought in the southwest. But, as they say, uh, the numbers are only a small part of the story. This also comes from the Times. As climate scientists have predicted, the world is seeing an increase in heat waves, storms, and other extreme weather as the planet warms, and in disaster like droughts, floods, and wildfires as a result. Uh, of course, there were record uh, catastrophes of uh, fire, fire catastrophes in Australia and California this year. Now, one thing that's interesting that I found out is that the pa pandemic, of course, has had a small effect on the overall pollution in the world. And they said it's uh, stated that the lockdown orders and economic slowdown and things like that have reduced greenhouse gas emissions by around 10% in the United States alone and throughout the world of some more. So that is a small but significant effect. However, and this is something that we don't expect, and this has to do with the issues of transportation. Now, uh, a greater short-term effect, this is, may be a reduction in some transportation-related pollution, of course. That's fewer cars, perhaps, although there seems to be a lot of cars now, and airplanes. Uh, and that will deal with a smaller percentage of nitrogen oxides uh, getting into the atmosphere and they but what they do is they form aerosols and reflect the sun's rays actually decreasing the warning warming so things are very complicated in fact uh, so that it's possible that in fact the decrease in overall transportation around the world and the uh, exhausts from transportation has actually contributed to the warming of the world in 2020. I don't know. Is thing, are things hopeless? I hope not. That's right. Okay, enough of that. Now, yesterday, though, uh, Joe Biden, the president-elect, in his speech outlined it's very uh, progressive, I would say, plan for economic and medical relief 
and this is something that can give us, uh, if he can actually make this effective, can give us a, actually a lot of optimism, I think. Uh, so, it's, it's a $1.9 trillion package. And so these trillions, we think, we, we can't imagine all those zeros, but this is kind of normal now. Uh, it includes, if this is for the United States, this is in addition to the 600 that Congress has uh, passed, uh, so, uh, how, how do I say, $600 check going to people is, uh, to, to help tie them over for in this economic issue. Oh, wow, I'm, I'm going, I'm totally uh, tongue-tied all of a sudden. Uh, he's, he's added a $1,400 stimulus check to, to go up to the 2000 which was what was originally proposed this way. Now, also, there's... A, in great increase in the national vaccine program, $160 billion of $20 for distribution, and much uh, uh, greater help for the states. And as, as uh, people may know, the problem is that the states, mo most of the states, or maybe all of them, I actually don't really know, uh, <clears throat> have in their constitutions a mandate for a balanced budget. And because of that, the states are actually suffering because what normally would happen is that the, if you did for a particular state, well, let's take New York State where I, we live, I live, and Ayako lives, and some of us <laughs> who are listening live as well, uh, has a shortfall in the budget, the federal government helps with that, and everything turns out okay. But since the government is not federal government, has not been doing that, even states like New York and uh, other states throughout, I would say just about every state in the Union is in trouble that way. Uh, we should not forget that the federal government as our currency issuer can always support the states. They just need the willpower to do that, but which they haven't until now, and hopefully they will. Uh, also, Biden has proposed at least $170 billion to prop up education, and I think that's very good. There's a lot going with this an increase in the minimum wage, or many things, many things. And this, uh, as he mentioned, he said, coming next Wednesday, and that's nice, that for next Friday's live stream, hopefully, we will have a very new administration already. okay <laughs> I'm getting these these cryptic signals once again <laughs> uh, see but he so he mentioned yesterday that Wednesday we begin a new chapter and this chapter is a way new but actually harks back to Franklin Delano Roosevelt back to the New Deal and back to the idea that, in fact, government can help. And also that the people and the economy are one and the same. That in order to, to stimulate the economy, okay, we must, we, the government, the people, must actually support the people. Or the, yes, I know, that was kind of a, a convoluted, but hopefully it makes the point. Uh, he, 
it's it's interesting that this sense of of government lasted into the 1980s but since the 1980s has been actually systematically in fact kind of eviscerated uh, now I'm of course speaking of the United States and there are people watching this from other countries but this plan of Biden's I think is is a bit of a model which is good for the whole world I think and let's hope that the, this plan is just the beginning of something which will actually uh, stimulate even more and uh, not only so-called growth because growth is a problematic word now and that's something that maybe I'll talk about in a, a later time uh, but will stimulate more activity to create better lives for all of us and well at least the train is running a little bit <laughs> now I haven't heard that very much uh, so to stimulate activity to make lo our lives better and to make our planet to continue to be basically habitable. Uh, okay, there's a little more news that I have, and this is a uh, few, two things only. First of all, I mean, personally, I can't wait till it's possible to actually travel. Anyway. And that's especially because just now an amazing museum was opened in Rome, the subterranean museum, which has unearthed part of Caligula. Caligula, of course, is the Roman emperor who is, uh, has the worst reputation of everyone. That's, that's really demonized, but there's a, the very famous, his very famous Garden of Delights, so that's an incredibly uh, luxurious and posh area, uh, was found actually doing an excavation in 2006. And uh, it, it has taken until now actually to actually organize things and to create this museum. It's, I really want to hear, to, to go there as whenever I can. And I think it's something that we all can do. This is a, a wonderful kind of snapshot of, of history. Uh, so I, I just read a tiny bit of what I, I uh, found about this. Said the dig carried out beneath the rubble of a condemned 19th century apartment complex yielded gems, coins, ceramics, jewelry, pottery, cameo glass, theater masks, seeds of plants, such as uh, apricot, uh, and that had actually been imported from Asia, bones of peacocks, deers, lions, bears, and ostriches. You can imagine in this fantastic little uh, garden, you had all these animals we don't know quite whether they were all in cages or they were sort of free to roam in areas, but quite amazing. And finally, uh, something that I, I just read about, which I find very interesting and very related in a way you never expect to music. And this is from uh, Harvard. And with this, I, I'm going to think, see if I can actually get, because there is a... Uh -huh. Yeah. This is the Harvard School of Engineering designed robotic fish, fish robots, little which 
kids f- swim as a, like a school of fish. Now, how f- fish actually do that, in other words, there's a school of fish will, will swim in a very organized way, but without any definite leadership. But in any case, they somehow always go together, whether it's left, right, in circles, etc. And uh, I'll read some of this because it's very it's fascinating. Schools of fish exhibit complex, synchronized behaviors that help them find food, migrate, and evade predators. No one fish or team of fish coordinates these movements, nor do fish communicate with each other about what to do next. In other words, they don't plan beforehand what they're going to do. Rather, these collective behaviors emerge from so-called implicit coordination, individual fish making decisions based on what they see their neighbors doing. Now, this is interesting. So they designed these uh, robotic fish with, to, have, to have sensors which picked up the movement of their neighbors. And that way they actually were able to mimic the motions of actual uh, swarms of fish. Now, let me sort of get this because this is kind of cute. Yeah, let's see if, if you can see this at all. Oh, stop it. Sorry about that. I had to put the internet on and this happened. It's not moving. What's that? Oh, it, it, it went low. Sorry. Just a, I'll just do a little bit. You can see that it's a small, but there, there's putting the fish in and see how they end up moving actually together, whether it's in a circle. Which one is a robot? The, all of them are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These are, these are, reg, these are real fish here. <laughs> this is, this is, huh? Now these are the these are the robotic fish, and how they're moving. Okay, I think that maybe people are, are that's a robotic fish. Okay, so that's enough of this. I would say. Okay, that's uh, basically it. Now, what struck me about this is how similar this is. To chamber music because you know if we you're you're playing well in a chamber ensemble we do we do sort of discuss things before but during the performance we move this way and we move that way depending on the individual members responses and that's why a wonderful chamber music performance can actually end up being totally different from what was decided upon in the rehearsal in a, a very creative way because we have this group moving together. Anyway. Uh, so I guess there is music in the motions in the swarms of fish. So that said, I think we can move now to what we need to do in order to have the technical ability to play chamber music well, perhaps. Well, you know, or I'm just being facetious in that. Okay, now what I want to do is move to here. Eventually we get that. And I'll put this back here. Okay, and now I should, what I'd like to do is, is go up and let's see. Yeah, if I can come here. Uh-oh. I put this 
to the side now. Are we okay? A little higher, yeah. Because I prefer to stand if I can. Are things all right still? Yeah. And the microphone is still okay? It's good. All right. Now, I want to just continue what I started last week uh, about I had exercises for this. I want to start though with finger exercises, what do, without the instrument, in fact. And what we need is, and I should actually first preface this by saying that what I'm actually explaining are things that I do, that ways that I've found for myself. Uh, I don't have um, any kind of scientific um, grounding for what I'm saying right now. And if any of you think that, oh, this is nonsense, that's absolutely fine with me. It just, it's something works for me, and that's why I'm presenting it to you. Okay, now the sense of rhythm. I've mentioned before how we need to have form also. And we need to feel that rhythm can go up and down like this. So I had the rubber bands, etc., etc. Now, what we can feel also is that we can move together again in a rhythmic way. So I do things like this. One, two, three, 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 one two 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 one you can have different, different combinations of this. Now, why is this good? It's just that we need to constantly, I believe, sort of stimulate the nerves which control our muscles so that we, can, we are always somehow having the sensitivity here. And when I go to the clarinet, for instance, I don't think I'm going to play this when I play. But I will also and I will we'll do this also in front of a mirror just so I can see how the fingers move. And one more thing is here. I will say, is that what I like to feel is that the fingers move to the same height. And I've talked about this uh, before, and I've even showed the wonderful video of, of the, the, uh, the drum battle between Buddy Rich and Gene Krupa, this is and this and how they move this these great drummers this uh, this this way and so we we do the same kinds of things but in a miniature way because they're, they're fingers and not the whole hand this way now together with that when we play the clarinet. As I've also mentioned, we should we have to, we should extend our bodies this way, and there are several reasons for that. And a big reason, though, is because we have to play in different parts of the reed for different registers, different partials, as I call them, different harmonics, which make up 
the actual total uh, range of the clarinet. So I will even do things I want to be da, 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 da. things like that. So you move up here. And also I do things like this. This to feel that the left hand controls a lot of what's happening with the clarinet. And I mentioned this also before that there are really only four notes. Do uh, you think I should play this at all? Maybe I do play a little bit, but I'm going to use another clarinet, I think, later. Maybe I'll use this. This is my the oldest of my new clarinets. this read okay yeah okay so uh, to feel that when we're playing you actually move this way here and with that in mind you can see I don't know if you can see my thumb and I, I do have a little like I developed this little skin issue so I do have a little stuff here, but basically I have almost no callus anywhere. Can you see? The two thumbs are almost this exactly the same. It, can you see them through that through that? Yeah. And especially here there is absolutely nothing. And uh it's not because I don't practice. <laughs> In fact, that's just what I like to do most. <laughs> is I like to practice. <laughs> but <laughs> what it means, though, is that I very rarely support the clarinet with this thumb. But I'm always supporting with two hands moving up. And again, as I, I mentioned quite often, there are really four notes only. Where there's no left thumb. And those are the four notes where the burden of the weight of the clarinet is, on, is only on this thumb. You see, because even the, these fingers here are not holding although you can hold a bit here and you know, this you get a little bit uh, flat as you go down but that is possible and there you do that a bit but basically because there's no left thumb you have to feel that this moves this way with the right thumb but the left thumb together with the fingers is really what supports the instrument I believe most of the time going that way so if I'm playing here here I have just about no pressure on my right thumb here. but what we need to feel though is that the fingers feel the holes here and actually this sponge squeezing happens and then here all of a sudden even though I'm doing this for instance the burden of weight shifts to here but then going up Is that way and um, but no matter what's happening I'm actually pulling the clarinet up here this way and you can feel that even in with an exercise for instance <laughs> feel how the left hand 
can support us. And it's this way. First, though, you probably should sit down and have the clarinet maybe between your knees or something so that you don't feel uh, any nervousness from the fact that you're actually holding the instrument in, in a weird way. So this is what it is, though. I, I start, and let's say we take the very easy F major scale. And just go from play the F. I take the thumb off the instrument. Maybe I go like this a little bit. Is this okay? No? Is this better? This way. Yeah? And then when they're here, I put the thumb back. And then I go to the B flat generally because it's easier to have a little uh, set reference, I should say, for where where you are. So there we feel how the weight shifts from here to here and back the other way. And then of course if you're playing for real, you do the same thing, or I should say I do the same thing, but not in such extreme form. Although I must say there are times when I do take the thumb off completely, because no matter what the, the feeling of, of them, sometimes you need to stretch your hand. That the, the stretching is very, very important. Okay, and you can do this with different variations, of course. I don't go into them, but that's, that's the uh, basis of this. Now, if any of you have questions as I'm doing this, please uh, note them and I will answer whatever I whatever you ask me. And if you disagree with me, you may too. That's fine. Uh, that's right. So, again, the sense of, of motion. Now, what's interesting about this motion up, and it's something that I've talked about before too, uh, and it has to do with the feeling that as I pull my body up, actually, I feel feel more grounded in my feet. And I do that whether I'm playing standing up or sitting down. So if I play this way, I'm pulling up, but this is pushing down. Now let's say I sit down here. Uh, <laughs> this chair's a little too low, but anyway, I do. <laughs> I'm again trying to extending the body with the feet going down this way. So there's always this kind of sense that I have. Okay, now I've been asked how to develop coordination in the fingers, and it's exactly this way, just by this, these rhythmic kind of repetitions, which we do. I'm going to stand up again, because it's more comfortable for me. Uh, these rhythmic repetitions, which we do with the clarinet, without the clarinet, different patterns, etc., etc. Uh, and we should feel, as also, that the whole hand can move. As well. So if I'm playing here, I would I would also have an exercise where it's really trills, which is very much what I talked about last time, but fast. And you go as fast as you can go, but make sure that you have the number of repetitions that you want to. So it's not, not sort of random, blah, 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 but I did 
different numbers, but I know exactly the n number that I'm doing. And you can, of course, in the beginning, if you have have trouble with with feeling the right number of notes, you do it slower so that you you can actually hone in on exactly the right number that you're doing. So, for instance, if I'm doing like that, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, down. Or, and one thing I, I have to mention is that when you are moving your hand, you, have, you find how the hand f works. And for instance, my hand is maybe peculiar in a way. Well, it's probably very normal. But if I'm playing this, what I prefer to do, and maybe it's a little weird, right, is I pull my hand back, and this finger I pull down. That way. It's kind of weird. And I'm not telling you that you should do that. <laughs> You can try it, but see how I get great control of this finger when I when I have that kind of positioning. But my point is that you find the shape of the hand, which will allow you to have control. So some people can do this or can have this this way, but for me, it's not as good as. For me, as, as that, that is, I mean, it's kind of weird, but uh, uh, it's okay. It hasn't hampered me at all. Uh, now, bef before I go on to something else, I want to move to breathing a bit. And I think this is also important for the fingers, and I will uh, explain why that is in a minute, but I put this back. And a, a lot of my background in breathing, and as it is for many uh, musicians, many wind players, uh, comes from the tuba player Arnold Jacobs, who uh, developed exercises for breathing, and especially developed what is called a finger breath, and other, uh, among other things. And the point of the finger breath, which you can also call the hand breath, is you feel that I don't know if you can hear that over this this way and the point is to, to Take a breath, but not have the pitch go up. Because the problem of that we have in inhaling is a lot of times we swallow our tongue like this. And we actually sort of also constrict our trachea, our, our windpipe. And I see that quite often people are going this way. So this actually gives you feedback. Can you hear, can people hear that actually? Yeah, yeah. And what the sound is, is turbulence of the air being pulled into your mouth on either side of the, of your hand. This way. And the lower the pitch you can get, the better off you are. And the interesting thing about that is you, if you bear down on your vocal cords, it doesn't work. So the tongue is out of the way. Now, I've refined that in a bit myself. Uh, to have the, the, so we have the finger breath, but also we should 
have a basic form, just like I was talking about form in the hands. We have a form when we are breathing. And I advocate always, for the clarinet at least, that we breathe, we take inhale through an A. A. The A is similar to the E, and I've mentioned before how the clarinet basically uses a language of one vowel, E, and it's different guises inside. It's a E, is all part of the E because the shape of the tongue is the same. Okay, now, A, E, A, E, the difference between those two is simply how open your mouth is. So, you take the breath through the A, and if all of you notice, if you actually experiment with this, if you just say, A, 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 how are you? A, that the tongue in the back pushes forward, so you don't just go, eh, eh, not this one, but a. Eh. So when you take your breath, and this happens when you have a good finger breath also. That the tongue actually pushes forward in the mouth. You don't think about it too much, but you just get the result of the a eh, this way. You can hear it. You can't hear it. A or we can I feel like here let's let's do let's do this again. <laughs> this is kind of funny. Uh and say if I say A and then I inhale and say or hey, how are you? Like that it doesn't work so uh, well, but it works well enough. So we take the breath through the A, which actually sets up the embouchure inside the mouth in the correct way. So then we can play here A Is it not working? Works okay. Oh, yeah. This way, my read's too dry, but anyway, it, it sort of works. So, and then you, t you can take a breath until you play this way. But to feel that you are always have this A E in the mouth. Now, I mentioned with the fingers here yeah, how you can practice rhythm. And it's a very good idea to practice rhythm in, in different guises. I, I said once again with the rubber bands going up and down with this way. And also just this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, dum, bum, one, two, one, two, one, two, ding, do, ding, do, ding, do, dum, bum, bing, bing, bum, bum, bing, dun, 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 ding, do, ding, do. It's kind of fun. That's right. You can walk down the street doing that. That's right. But uh, in the mouth as well, for instance, when I'm speaking to you now, I'm actually practicing. I'm practicing, first of all, gaining sensitivity inside the mouth to know what is happening, and then also to keep feeling, I feel E, so feeling, I practice the E. I'm, I'm, I'm. In English, is a language of diphthong, so that's always we have a, two vowels together. So English is quite easy. Oh, there's another E I practiced. Uh, anyway, there's an A that I practiced. So I'm always practicing this. And the reason that I think it's such a good idea to practice things with the fingers, with their even breathing, that's a and even with your nose, you can breathe. And it's much better in general to breathe through your nose, of course, to inhale through your nose. And sometimes I do that in the clarinet as well. Uh, but 
to feel how the lungs actually expand. And I will get to this in, in a second now. Uh, but this practicing constantly is so important because we cannot practice our instruments as much as we, or let's say personally, I would love to. It's impossible for us to practice enough hours to actually master things that we need to master. And I think the only instrument probably which is where that's possible is the piano. And uh, there it's still uh, very possible to injure yourself by practicing, over-practicing, which uh, happens quite often. Uh, more about breathing now. And this has to do with what the lungs are. And I don't have with me, actually I have it somewhere, but uh, I, I couldn't find it. Uh, this is a bag. It's a breathing bag, uh, which you can buy. And this, this is also very uh, common, very popular. It comes originally from Arnold Jacobs as well. And it, the general breathing bag is five liters of air. And just about everybody, I believe, has a capacity of at least five liters. But we generally use maybe one to two liters of air only. But one thing uh, we, sh we have to know is that we have different, in a way, sections of the lungs and which are controlled by different sets of muscles. And the way the, uh, you, you, the yoga of breathing, which is called pranayama, and someone who knows this better than me can actually correct me for all the mistakes I probably make on this. But uh, they divide the lungs in three parts, which is very useful for us. And you have the down here, the lungs actually go here, and in the back they go lower, around. And you have the diaphragm, which is a membrane connected to muscles around here, which pull the diaphragm and then pull the lungs down and up and out that way. Now we also have pectoral muscles that surround the, the ribs. And actually they will pull the ribs this way and this way, actually inflating the lungs in the middle. And then there are also muscles connected to the top. And I don't remember their names, and it's not so important. I mean, it's nice to know, but not something that I have, have bothered particularly to commit to memory. Uh, these muscles here will pull the lungs up. So the three should work together, and in fact should work in a way in sequence. And this is... And if we have in yoga, we start down with the lungs, then the middle, and then the top. And with that, we actually can inflate the lungs to around five liters. And if you have the bag, you can actually envision this way. Uh, and so as we have, let's say we have this much air, and we start here, up to there. Now the issue is when we play, what happens? And uh, many people uh, feel that they don't have much lung capacity. But the problem most often, I would say, and I could say all the time, but I don't know, I, there must be exceptions, is that they do not use the lungs efficiently, simply. So, let's say we take this clarinet again, and if I'm, if 
I'm playing, as I inhale first this way, starting here, going around pectoral muscles and up throughout, like that. then when I exhale, I go the same way generally. So I start down and then I may actually reach the limit of the way the lungs collapse down here. Then I go to the middle and then I go to the top. This way. So let's say how, do, how shall I demonstrate this? Uh, let's say I take the breath. Because I start here, and then I feel that if this is uh, what, what do you call it uh, uh, exhausted, let's say here, what I have, then I go here, and then finally I use the air that's here. I don't know if this is clear at all to people. What that say? Okay, now, what happens with the fingers and the breathing? That's what I was talking about. Is that the fingers should feel the rhythm of the air. So the same way, you can't really see it, but I'm, I'm gonna have that squeeze in rhythm. And that finger works with the air and actually with the feet. fingers this way uh, let's say we do something fast uh, what should what should I do something like this I don't know why I'm using Debussy but why not there I feel he with the air and the fingers work with that that way. So this is the sense of what I'm talking about when I speak about this kind of whole body playing. So the air leaves and then the fingers move with the air this way. And then the tongue moves with the fingers of course. And tonguing is something I, I will get into in one of the classes coming up. Uh, and of course with this breathing there's also circular breathing and I will actually uh, do one one presentation about circular breathing similarly with multiple tonguings I will do that as well uh, and there, and of course everything is is connected now my question is what time is it let's see <laughs> Yeah, we have some time, I think. Yeah, we still have time. So, what I wanted to do, I wanted to move on from here to actually looking at a piece of music and how we physically can find the expression that's necessary. So that the way we, we are act, actually working 
is we're we are acting. I, this is again something. I think I'm just repeating myself in all these uh, live streams, but we are acting out things. And I wanted to uh, show how that works in Elliot Carter's Gra. I did. I do believe that I I spoke about Gra a bit. I spoke about the middle part and the. the stretching of tempo, etc., etc., but I don't think that I, I went in detail about it and about how I go about looking at it for performance, which is uh, compelling, I guess insightful and fun. Okay, now for that, I think I'm going to actually use another clarinet. I don't know why, but I'll try. I just, because this is the one that I've wanted to use today, and I just picked up the wrong one before. And now I do have the music here, and I need to, actually, I have to do one thing before I do this. One second. So let's work this out in a, in a quick way. You can see this here. Okay. Now, as basically I hope all of you know, or at least most of you know, actually, before I play something, I do need this. Are there any questions about what I did before? Wow, that's amazing. Okay, hopefully. People are not too bored with this. That's why they don't ask questions. Uh, but so the here, or I have a better. In this, as we see, we have two different types of music in a way. This is here, the extended lyrical, and these are the 16th of faster kind of scampering music that way. Now, as I'm Imagine I mentioned. Can you talk, say again, because there was didn't, microphone didn't catch. Oh, the microphone didn't catch. Okay, can you hear me now? That's okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. I'm so sorry. So there are two kinds of music here. Okay, one is lyrical and it's slurred here, and the other detached, but scampering kind of music. And they're separated not only by rhythmic value, so this is in, in our triplets, and here we have the sixteenth notes and then fives, so faster, but also in dynamic. That way. Okay. Now, as I believe I probably mentioned, that this whole piece is in a language of three. And when we look at works, it's uh, very good to see what the what the basic structure is, because that tells us how to move. 
things. Now, Carter is not the only one who liked the language of three, and in this piece in particular, but uh, uh, for instance, Brahms in both sonatas has basically a language of three. So you have in, in the finally in the first sonata, one, two, three, the second sounds more complex, but also you have three and two different kinds of threes often, but it's always somehow this three moving through. Okay, so this language of three is here, and I will first actually uh, show how it works. Uh, let me put this here, maybe, so I can get to it. But let's go back to this, and we say one, two, and then we forget about this here right now, because he has broken these two things, and I will explain why he has this one, two, and then he goes up F, A flat, B flat. And then if we notice, we have the same thing here, F, and then A flat, B flat coming. So if we just have those, whoops, let me put this here, it's in here. And uh, I'm probably going to go back to the other clarinet because I don't think this is going to work a lot. I'll have this. Maybe I show you my read. Don't. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> I know it's too disgusting looking, <laughs> <laughs> but this read is is this is an antique. So. This is the read I used in 1993 to play the first performance no. of this piece. Of course not. Yeah. <laughs> still works though so we have this now, for some of you that may be familiar but I'm not going to so talk more about that okay and then he does that again one two three there then we go on to measure five to there, one, two, three. Then he has again. One, two, three, one, two, three. And it continues this way. I don't want to go through the whole piece. It's too, maybe boring to, to show that to all of you. But you can, if you have the music, check it out. And you will find that the whole thing parses into threes. Although it's a little bit complex. And I will explain about that. Now let's go to the, the other notes here, which I, I uh, a lit, sort of uh, didn't play, let's say. Uh, so we have this, one, two, next measure, three, one, two, three. And then next measure, one, two, three. And then we have what? Here, next measure, one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, one, two, Three. So, so it's one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, which makes nine, or three groups of three. Next one, one, two, three, and next one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and next here, as we go to this. We, th we this is where it becomes a little bit tricky because Carter has the first of those notes is one the F and then you have th and that five you have three there so that's one two three one and then he has two sixteenth notes 
of from the five, which is two three. I don't know if people can see that. Let me just explain perhaps here. Uh, can I find it? Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Uh, it's here, right? Yeah. Yeah? So you have one long node. Then here, one, two, three, one, two, three. Then one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera. So we, as I said, we parse the whole thing into threes, this whole piece into these. So this is the language of three. And that's important to have in the background. But what's even more important is to know how Carter, in a way, personifies music and uh, he takes either if there are ensemble pieces, pieces he will have different instruments in a certain way being different characters and they have their own lives and he separates them by rhythm and by dynamics in a certain way by tempo also and that he, he does by rhythm so you can have for instance, some, somebody's playing in fives, but in fact, what they're playing is in four, but at a faster tempo than someone else who's playing in four. Uh, does that make sense to people? <laughs> Probably not, but trust me. <laughs> you see, or... Uh, so if you're playing the fours as, as in, in groups of five, it's one-fifth faster you're actually playing. So anyway, uh, the, uh, arithmetic is not so complicated in this. Okay, now in this piece here, it's one instrument, but as you can see from this beginning, there are two characters. And what the, is the challenge for us as performers is to bring out these two characters. How we, how we do that. Okay, now Carter has given us a lot of information because he has the first piano here, just going up to mezzo forte. Then you have a rest, and then here we have forte and sixteenth notes, very different rhythm. Okay, now I give you a little bit of history, which is, uh, when I first went to him, this was 1993, he had just finished the piece, he had been sending me copies of it, he finished, and I went to his, he had a uh, summer home in uh, Southbury, Connecticut, so I went there to to play this piece for him first. This would be the first time they actually heard the piece, uh, on the clarinet at least. He heard it in his mind, of course. Uh, and I went, I started out, and he went, no. I went, oh, okay. He said, no, it's mezzo forte, then forte. Hmm. Okay, I try again. And that went on, <laughs> I don't know how long, maybe 15 minutes, I don't think so, not that long. But then, I understood. And for that, what you actually need is to really physically feel that you are different characters. So. Yes. And then, you see, so there is a sense of this character finishes, then this starts. Now, in order to do this in, in this piece, and this is something that we will have in, to do often in music, is you actually add commas. You add, you add breaks to this. So, 
rather than play as one line, you separate this and that. Okay, now, what does this have to do with technique? A lot. Because I play, and then I don't do this, of course, which I'm doing now, but I feel that. Okay, and then I change my rhythm, and again, I play, and then I stop. So, this kind of playing, and then this playing, and that, playing, and that, is so gives a different kind of technique this. So, all that happening. Then we continue, and again, this espressivo character. something else in music, which is something that I feel very strongly, uh, is that, in fact, there are what I call universal affects, or what I even like to call them, is universal icons. So these are gestures in music, and I've, again, have, have talked about them before, but they have a meaning which is outside of the piece itself. And composers and uh, performers should recognize them, or the composers, when they use them, do recognize them. And performers should be aware of them. So here, for instance, we have the, whoops. <laughs> See, yeah, it's odd. I think that, here, let me do, let me help you. So I can say that. Uh, we have the drop of the minor third. Oh. And that drop of a minor third always has a particular kind of sense. Just like a, a rise of a half step. will generally have a particular sense to it. So here, and especially in, in this kind of piece where he is having a dialogue of two characters who are very different personalities, we have here this one which is kind of sentimental. So first you have that, and if you notice, See, that he is trying to indicate this sentimentality in a very clear way. Now, do I, do I see this? It's, where is it? I think page, it is next page. next page, right? Yeah, here. There, you see how you have the hairpin going down, then up here, and then here. He even puts the tenuto there with this diminuendo. Can pe people see that? Yeah? Okay. So, the shape that he is outlining is actually very, very clear. But we have to know the meaning of the shape, which, in a way, as I say, is iconic. In other words, it is, this is a gesture which we can find in Baroque music, in Renaissance music, in 
classical music, in folk musics around the world in general. That so. And then he changes. Oh, there. Okay, I'm not going to get into what he's doing tonally. There, that, that, that's a very interesting part. But you may notice that we have the same notes, just about. This way, with you changes a little bit. Um, so, he overlaps different sections in this way. Uh, now this is, a, a, again, kind of technique which we see, for instance, in older composers. We see that most often, of course, in the composer Brahms. We see it in Beethoven. We see it in, in so many composers. So here we have a piece of new music, let's say. It's still rather new, 93, right here, considering that many people can think of the Berg pieces as new music though it's more than 100 years old. Uh, but the techniques involved are there from the beginning. And this is actually something that uh, Picasso, and I, when I uh, read the interview with him, his, the article, that was an abstract of, of his interview, actually talked about how you do not have old painting, new painting. You have painting. And the old painting is new for today as well. And the new painting is in a way old. That it's all has this similar sense of the person's viewpoint. Yeah. So here, we have the similar sense of, of how you create the piece, you know, whether it's, it's Bach or Carter. So we go from here. That way. And then again, threes or... contrast in here, Carter has taken from, I would say, from classical music, which is based on this, I'm talking about the music of the time of Mozart, that's why, this is, which is based on, on an opposition, this kind of contrast, and he has actually uh, taken it and explored it to the, I'd say, to the nth degree. So, in, in taking that and then actually looking and seeing that as a kind of theater where you are, you are different characters, and in this piece we're different characters even though we're one character. So it's a kind of uh, monologue where I use different hats. So. <laughs> Etc. Et 
etc. as we move on. Uh, and technically, we have this feeling of motion and stopping, motion and stopping, this way. Uh, you know, I'm going to take a detour, and then I will finish the piece. It's going to be in, in parts, but so I wanted to do different things, but we, we can always, everything kind of moves in this pandemic time through the, through the weeks. Uh, this is a more subtle way. But we go now back to Mozart Concerto. Let's see if I can actually put. No, this is the wrong instrument. Do I have the right instrument? I think I have one someplace. Where do I have it? Oh, I have one here. Ah, oh, okay. different character and different character but what I wanted to show in particular is later on a little bit you know, and the Mozart concerto is, a, is really kind of opera which uh, has different characters but played by one person and uh, where the basset clarinet, it's actually more clear even. But let's say we have, uh, after, do we have? And then usually I hear this going. But in fact, what Mozart's doing is you have one character come in. And then you have another character. Yeah. Coming in, so one says, Oh, I don't know, what should I do? And the other character goes, Oh, do not fear, I'm here. <laughs> And then a different scene comes in. And then all of a sudden, should be an octave lower, etc., etc. Okay, so this is just a little snapshot of a piece of a very different era of different language in a certain way, but with the same kind of sense that we have different characters and the same, in a way, theatricality. Yeah. So now I go back. Uh -huh. Okay. to our friend Gra, which means playful. It's like Igra in the back, that's what it should be. Uh, ooh, did I do this right? So, we're going from here, and I'll continue. And this here, we go into this middle section, at least. And then the music changes in a way very dramatically from this middle section. So, uh,
here you know, we have an iconic phrase, I call it, because which could be a little echo of Beethoven. has changed from before. So where before the characters are separated, here they sort of morph together. So they, it's just like you take this one, oh, so. Just to show you how his phrase is always going through these threes. So we have here. He always said, well, this is kind of jazzy. Well, whatever. Ooh, that was not good. I'm going to play again. And then notice how everything is moving around that one note and then changes. before a little too fast perhaps just to get through it but I have to explain how I look at it I think this way now first of all it's very strictly in threes of course two three one 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 two three and then then going on here <laughs> that and I find it very interesting and so much fun in a way because from here I'm going through the partials from seven to five to three to one so it's actually 
when people think, oh God, this is so hard. In fact, it's incredibly easy. Because if you think of it as if you're just in, in on, a, on a violin, for instance, and you're just going from the E string to the A to the D to the G string, like this way, and you just do it in your mouth. You see? And they are basically all variations of pretty much the same fingering. So, so all of that this way. And then then I have to speak about this multiphonic, which is kind of a detour, but Unfortunately, the fingering is not completely correct that's in the music. And this is a, a, for this, I have to go here. This is because of this. Yeah, I have this here. I don't know if, how, if any of you know this book, but Bruno Bertolozzi. He wrote the first book, it's called New Sounds for Woodwind, and this is the first book which actually lists and uh, mentions how to play, etc., etc., multiphonics, not only in the clarinet, but the flute, the bassoon, and the oboe also, just for woodwinds, this way. And unfortunately, a lot of the fingerings are not correct. <laughs> But it's a great, this, I, when, when was this book actually, it's in 1967, was, was published, and it's, I think that's, it's actually an earlier, uh, there's, a, not, there's not an earlier publication, but his research was earlier, and uh, many composers, in for, for, all, all the woodwinds sort of use this as the basis. Now there are better books, and uh, I've actually also created a table, which I, I hope that uh, I will post for everyone to use, which I think is, is actually quite logical for multiphonics. But uh, the one thing is that Italian clarinetists, and those of you, if you're any of you from Italy, who is, you should definitely go to the museum in Rome, but uh, you will know that until rather recently, what was uh, standard in Italy was to play a clarinet that had a low E flat always. That's why also with our Barrio Sequenza, there's a, the multiphonic requires that E flat. This actually doesn't require it, but he does write it out because that's in the fingering chart and of course it's even impossible to do because you have only two little fingers here and if we have this one here and the one here you have no way to get to your E flat as well you know that's that's uh, uh, you know whatever uh, so that's not that's not uh, correct but I'm talking about this a lot now because we I find so often people play the wrong notes and this is uh, something that you would never think of doing if you were playing Mozart concerto for instance but here somehow they, they play they think they don't hear it whatever so I would say more than 50% of the times I've heard this people play this, the multiphonic is not correct. But it has to be correct. And the, uh, there was a problem originally that uh, this was a French fingering and for, so it didn't work on the German clarinet. So Carter was very worried about that. And uh, luckily I, I was able to, to give him a fingering for the German clarinet. Because when he talked to me about that, he was even said, well, if it doesn't work for the German clarinet, but only for the French, maybe I have to recompose the whole ending. Because this is so important. Now, it's a twelfth. 
Now, you would think that if you know anything about the acoustics of the clarinet, that the twelfth will work no matter what. And uh, it works really great on the old clarinet with five keys only or something. That it, it, then it's really perfect, in fact. But with our instruments, it's if to do just this way is a is little bit difficult because it's too out of tune. That's why we have this odd fingering here. But if you notice, you'll see the very beginning of this piece, and I'll show you here, as he moves, and there's a fourth, He has that F. Now that F is very important here. And that F, he has this here, but he moves finally to that B flat. It's a fourth here. So we can, we can look at this inverted, for instance, as the fifth. And then the end of the piece, he resolves everything with the F to the C. Here, I, sh I should use this, right? Yeah. And then here, he is one half step higher. So he's mo like modulate up, and then it's almost as if he has this Neapolitan cadence, which ends up with the F and C. So again, it's very classical and very well thought out. Yeah. So please, everyone, play the right multiphonic if you play this piece. So anyway, we have and there, remember, that's C, G, then F sharp, C sharp, and the end. as he moves down chromatically from there. So we have this, and then he goes again. more I want to talk about, but it will wait till next time. So thank you all for bearing with me, and I hope that I made this piece a little clearer and showed how we can move in a way that creates these different characters. Okay. So take care. Next time, we will have a new administration in the United States and hopefully a much brighter future. Okay, thank you.